Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're here with us, worshiping, learning about God, studying his word. And uh, I recall very well doing this last time. Uh, it was Valentine's Day. It was five months ago. And uh, I was looking at the calendar this week, and I can't believe it's been five months since I last stood up here and did this. And uh, I, I mentioned last time, I complained about where Ken dropped the last sermon, and I was in a very awkward position at the end of the chapter, uh, trying to finish up the chapter. Well, I, I think you bamboozled me again. I think we're in a, I really do want to finish up Matthew chapter 27 for us today. And uh, we're going to do that. Chapter 27 ends with Christ's death. And that's one of the things that makes it awkward, I think, for me uh, preparing for this, and uh, can I really preach only on Christ's death? Uh, well, we're going we're gonna to see where this goes. Um, next Sunday, we're going to have Chris Kellermeyer here uh, preaching on probably something other than Matthew, and uh, when, when Ken returns to the pulpit, we'll, we'll just drop him very neatly at Matthew 28.1, if that's okay with you, sir. Um, so well, let's, let's go to a Lord in a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray today that I bring your word to your people and that they would hear it and come closer to you. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Words. I'm a little picky about language and I call it being careful and I say exactly what I want to say when I want to say it. Uh, and so... Uh, flip side to that is I, I'm also very much an introvert. I could sit in a room full of people and say nothing for hours on end and for days on end, if you will. Uh, and, and I'm okay with that. Uh, I can talk, obviously. I can, we can have a conversation. But uh, I don't really care to use a lot of words where a few will suffice. That's, that's how I am. Um, we'll see how that works out today with me right here. I don't know, uh, you know, we, we'll, you feel free to judge uh, if, if you think otherwise after I'm done today. But some words that are out there, we've simply destroyed through overuse and misuse. And a really good example I have in, um, I guess, medium term history here is, uh, do you remember, you may not have been around then, but you remember 1991, the Gulf War? Um, who remembers the word? And I, really, was that 30 years ago? Yeah, it was. Um, do you remember the word decimate? I remember hearing that word a lot. Um, the U.S. coalition forces were raining bombs down on the Iraqis. Uh, we were shooting Scud missiles out of the air with our Patriot missile batteries, and I watched a lot of TV during that time. Um, and uh, CNN was covering all of it on their single cable channel. And there was a 24-hour news feed from Kuwait, from Saudi Arabia, from Baghdad, from D.C., and we got all of it through that feed. There was a, only a hint or a whisper of nothing that you considered, nothing that uh, we would look at and consider that today's Internet, but there was only a whisper of that. There wasn't any Internet, so you could go look at things and see live videos over and over and over and over. You had to be glued to that TV. But the U.S. military and the media machine and, and the first Gulf War, quite honestly, just absolutely destroyed the word decimate. They didn't decimate it, they destroyed it. Um, <laughs> you know, you heard on the TV, coalition military forces have decimated the Iraqi Republican Guard, and the world was allowed to assume that decimated meant total destruction, but it didn't. Um, it really means 10%. If I have 100 soldiers and I send them into battle and only 90 come back, then I've been decimated. And it only talks about that 10%. But they, they ruined it, you know. And, and so uh, we, the military and the media had no troubles allowing the world to believe otherwise because that was sensational. If I can believe that they, oh, total destruction, that's great. Well, no, it's not great. But um, it's sensational. I guess people coming back. And I recall a friend of mine running into the room he goes, we've decimated the Iraqi Republican Guard. And I go, okay, you know, back up a little bit. 
we're, we're okay. Um, and I keep going back to the princess bride where uh, um, Inigo says to Vizzini, you guys know this, don't you? You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means, right? Another word that I hear a lot, and I'm going to talk about the derivatives of this word um, is that, that gets used and abused and overused is uh, crucifixion. Uh, some of the derivatives of that, crux, which doesn't necessarily reference the, the punishment of crucifixion, but it represents uh, two primary ideas coming together in a cross. See that? And then so the center of that is the crux of your argument, or it can be the main point, or something like that. Um, but another one is crucify. Well, not hockey's over. There was, this is a theoretical hockey game, but uh, the hockey game, they, they beat their opponents 10 to 1. They crucified them. Did they really? That's, that's some pretty harsh language, I think. Um, but the one that really gets me, well, the root is hidden a little bit on this one, is excruciating. It's not completely obvious that it's a reference to crucifixion, but it is. And this is the worst one for me. When someone sprains their ankle or they break a bone or they get a hangnail, oh, that's excruciating. The pain is excruciating. And my answer is, is I feel for you, but really? Is it really that bad? Um, it, I, I, I think it has something to do also with the human tendency, or maybe it's just an American tendency, I don't know, uh, to speak in superlatives so that we have the most impact. I, wanna, I want you to hear what I say, so I'm going to speak in the superlative. So I'm going to say this pain is excruciating. Um, but I see all of these words pointing back to the cross of Christ. And I see the overuse and misuse of these words as a harassment of that same cross. Um, many people simply don't think about where their words come from. Or if they do, they see these words pointing back to simply a method of execution that the Romans really favored. And that's also what crucifixion is. Um, but as, as a Christian, as somebody, when I hear that word, it has power and it has value and it affects me greatly. So with that, let's jump into the text, starting with verse 50 of chapter 27. I'm sure I'm overlapping a little bit with last week and I'm going to call up that okay up front. Verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him Keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his new tomb and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember now, or we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people. 
He has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, is one of the major events in human history. Jesus is hanging on the cross. It's been dark for six midday hours. And he's cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's been scourged, taunted, stabbed, mocked. He can't breathe. And these are his final minutes or even seconds of his physical life on earth. He's known from the start why he's here, what he's here to accomplish, and the path that fulfills that mission on earth as a man. And yet he's questioned to the Father his calling and his path In the Garden of Gethsemane, just the previous chapter in Matthew 26, in verse 39, he asks, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He's always in the will of the Father, but even then, has his doubts, has his questions, I really don't want to do this. And I think every single one of us would be in that situation too. And just before giving up his spirit, he not only accuses the father of forsaking him, it's a righteous accusation, it's true, the father forsook him. That's He cries out in anguish in a phrase that is remembered and will always be remembered. Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabachthani. One of the few phrases in any of the Gospels or even in the whole Bible where we get the actual untranslated words of the person speaking it. We get not just the content, but the actual utterances, the original language. What a gift from the disciple Matthew to give us that. These were the last Words spoken by Jesus. These are the actual words, it's not just the English translation. Jesus had doubts. He was obviously scared on some level about what he was about to experience, about what he was about to go through. The death, I'm sorry, it's not on an eternal level, but the anguish was real. The pain was real. The death was real. And he, just like anyone, would have preferred any other path. And he made those requests to God the Father. And I would say that this is the culmination of his ministry, the climax of the story, the end, but it's not. In fact, if dying is all Jesus did as a great sacrifice as that would be to our benefit, would we have any hope at all if he didn't also conquer death and his resurrection? That's in two Sundays. Accompanying his moment of death is a series of events that are outlined here in Matthew 27 that seem at first, to me, when I read it, some sort of overflow of God's power, some kind of signal that God has worked here, and some of his cosmic splinters are simply affecting the area around his work. He's obviously about to resurrect Christ. So wouldn't some of that power spill out around him and some other people would get resurrected just as a, for being in the same area? No, but, but it, it, it seems like that. The, the events, number one, Ken talked about this last week, the temple veil torn in two, that 60 foot tall curtain. That curtain that exists to separate the glory of God from anyone who might come near, protecting them 
from catching a sideward glance on it because when you do that, you die. People aren't allowed to see the glory of God. Not on this planet. The curtain that only a ceremonially clean high priest and even then only once a year on the designated day is allowed to go behind. That curtain that sealed the glory of God was torn in two, telling the world there's a new high priest. The earth shook. The tombs were open. This is where Matthew 27 opened my eyes a little bit. I went, there were other resurrections? Okay, I got to deal with this. The tombs were opened because the rocks were split. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. How many people weren't really positive that was a part of Matthew 27? I'll raise my hand. Just me. Okay. So I read that and I go, what do I do with that? That's... Well, after the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. There was a lot going on that day. When I say it appears that there was an overflow of God's power at work here, I don't mean that God lost control. I'm like, okay, we're going to, you know, use my power to focus. Some of my power is going to fall over here. Whatever happens, that happens. No, that's not what happened. Because God does not lose control. The resurrections happened on purpose. Why don't, why don't we talk about this more? When we talk about Jesus and his path to the cross, his scourging, his taunting, his death, his resurrection. And it feels to me like we skip over this part where people, quite a few people get resurrected. What does that look like? I mean, we're not given a lot here. It's a sentence or two. And one of the things, I'll break off a little bit here. One of the things I really like, one of the things I'm really jealous of, one of the things I brag about with the Village Bible Church is the way that we teach the word. Let's pick a book. Let's start at verse 1, 1, and go to the last verse in that book. You know, we're going to go to uh, Matthew 28, 20, last verse of Matthew, and we're not going to skip a single verse, and it makes us work through things like this. I can't go, resurrection, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with that later. Let's get to the Christ's resurrection. That's the important part, right? It's all important. So, we go through the book in order, skipping nothing. And the implication and reality of that is that we're going to hit verses like this. And we tend to say, well, there's a verse that I got to deal with, okay? I don't necessarily like that tone. I don't like that attitude that perspective um, because the honest truth is that it's God dealing with us he's the one who has to deal with us we're not the one that has to deal with him I want to fit you into my life somehow right there no that's not how that works um, the honest, God's dealing with us he is the one condescending he's the one slowing down so that we can catch up so this week I come across verses 52 and 53. I knew I'd found this week's difficult verses and now I'm paying the price for our teaching style and that's a good thing. And we don't want to skip over them. Skipping over is what I call a bad idea. We're not given a lot of go on. Most of the details would be superimposed and I don't say non-scriptural or a-scriptural. But what we can glean from the scripture is this. God's earthquake seems to have been aimed at opening the tombs of select saints so they could be resurrected and go to the holy city. That the bodies were still in the tombs indicates that they probably didn't die very long ago. We're not talking about the patriarchs. We're not talking about 400, 500, 1,000-year-old tombs. We're talking about 5, 10-year-old 
Tombs? People who knew Jesus, most likely. These resurrections were disciples. Not the big 12, but the, the, the rest of the following, who had known Jesus in his life. We don't know this for sure, but they were probably Lazarus resurrections in that they were brought back to life, and then they experienced a physical death again at some point. We, do, we, don't, we don't know. That's, that's a presumption that I'm making. Also, the book of Matthew as a whole is written in a mode or a tone of historical fiction. Or, I'm sorry, that's a mode and a tone for one of our, our, our literature today. It's written as a historic account. It's history. The English language doesn't really have a good equivalent of that kind of writing because they would use certain words, they would use certain sentence structures, they would build the whole body of the, uh, of the book a certain way because it's historic. There's, he's telling history. He doesn't shift out of that mode when he tells us about the resurrection of these saints. He's still telling it as history. And I think that's very important. And he just he drops it in there with a list of everything else that's happening. The earthquake, the stones split in two, the saints were resurrected. Let's keep going. Um, so I, I look at this categorization means a lot in the original language. And um, verses 52 and 53 are written as historic account, just like the rest of the entire book. In other words, it's not figurative. This actually happened. And it seems like a party resurrected for celebrating Jesus' return with his resurrection. And it doesn't seem, if it, I, I, again, I say it doesn't seem a bit silly and odd. And it, maybe it just because it th threw me for a, a loop when I, when I read it. I go, that, you know, there's something that uh, God needs to deal with me about. Uh, but does the, uh, if, if that seems silly and odd and weird, well, how about this? Let's add to the list. How about uh, eating an apple and judging the entire mankind? How about destroying the earth in a flood except for six people and a bunch of animals? How about the defeat of a walled city simply by marching around it seven times? Three faithful men being thrown into a furnace to be burnt alive, but they weren't. The virgin birth. The enemy, via people that we value, will throw poison darts at us in the form of their almighty science. And I want to show you something. I'm holding a box, okay? And that box says science on it. That box... I'm going to tell you, I, I love science. I really do. I love it when things make sense. I love it when, uh, you know, two bodies that have mass will attract each other, the earth and the bottle cap. That's why we have this thing called gravity. It's predictable. Things make sense in our world. And the enemy's darts will tell you that if science can't make sense of it, then it must be Nonsense. It must be gibberish. If we can't explain it with science, then it doesn't exist. And then they do that. You're God. That's what they'll do to you. Our faith tells us that God created science as the method by which his created world will normally operate. That's an incredible tool. The lost will say if it doesn't fit in the box, it can't exist. The box is very big to them. The Christian is not ignorant of science. The Christian is also a critical thinker who will say, we spend most of our time in that physical box. But anything that happens outside the box is obviously a miracle of God. Which we never discount as a possibility. I say, our world is bigger than theirs, but they think theirs is bigger than ours. I, I'm not really sure why that is. But we aren't ignorant of science, and please don't let anyone do that to you. So I, for one, 
excuse me, one thing is for sure. If, if you want a reason for all of this, the, the stone and the resurrections and, and the commotion, look at the centurion in verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. Even if we don't know the eternal disposition of that Roman guard, although I think I do, God was glorified that day. Through that sequence of events, through those resurrections, through the Romans even acknowledging the deity of Christ. If we pan the moving camera off of that into the distance, we see the women in Jesus' life still following him. They may not have a clue that he's about to be resurrected if they listened and if they interpreted correctly and if, if, if. They, they might be waiting for a resurrection, but I think they're, they're in mourning and they're caring for someone that they love deeply. Still caring for him. They're still present and they're still seeking his presence. They miss him. There were many women there. I'm sorry, I'm reading verse 55 now. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And they remained even as the tomb of Jesus was determined via Joseph of Arimathea. Starting with verse 57, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus and then Pilate ordered it to be given to him and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb which he had cut it into the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. Joseph is described here as a rich man and a disciple. Just eight chapters earlier in Matthew 19, verse 24, Jesus says, Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Eight chapters hence, Matthew 27, Matthew is showing us in Joseph what that looks like. A rich man, but a disciple nonetheless. Joseph provides not only the tomb, but the heavy stone that will seal it. And dealt with Pontius Pilate to secure the body of this man who's been crucified as a criminal. Joseph had a privileged place in society. He was on the council. And dealing with the Roman governor... Just about always, you, you were uh, risking just about anything at the whim of that governor. Um, and so you can say Joseph risked a lot by going to Pilate and saying, I, I would like the body of this very controversial figure that you had crucified. <clears throat> the tomb was to be for Joseph's family. He bought it. It was brand new. He went to one of those funeral planning services and said, yeah, that's the plot that I want for my family right there. And I mean, if you fast forward to today, that's probably what that looks like. You got the nice sarcophagus and everything is there. But I'm a disciple of this man who was unjustly killed and that's going to be his tomb instead. And again, just like Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother, don't know if he realized that the tomb would be vacated in a few days or not, but he offered it uh, out, of, out of his incredible generosity, and it was more than money. It was his spirit. It was his place in the community. The Luke account has a little more detail about Joseph here, just a little bit. Um, there was a man named, this is, I'm sorry, Luke 23, 50 through 53, 
Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. There's the answer to my question right there. He was a good and righteous man. We're going to see him in heaven. Who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever been, had ever yet been laid. The, like I said, there was a brand new tomb. We really don't know anything else about this Joseph, but I think there's a, we can certainly learn a lot from him in, in the short encounter that we have from him in Matthew and in Luke. Guard at the tomb. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, I'm starting in verse 62 here, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise. They keep repeating this phrase, and they don't believe it for a second. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. What do we make of this? I make of it this, Christ's death and the resurrection, which we will hear about. I don't necessarily have to preach on the text of the resurrection, but I got to include them both. It's death and resurrection. They, they, they go together. Christ's death and resurrection are historical fact. Matthew is a historical document, and he tells us about that. It's hard to celebrate a death, especially one as brutal as Jesus experienced. It was brutal, and we have to get our minds around this, our emotions around this, something, our spirit around this. It was undeserved. Not for a single second did he deserve anything that he went through. But it's a paradox. And I want to explain it's not contradiction. It is not a contradiction. It is a paradox. Our God is bigger than we are. And his dealings and the things that he conducts in aren't something that this feeble brain will ever be able to fully comprehend. Therefore, it's a paradox. It's a paradox of the Christian faith. But it's the keystone of our faith. And it requires the sacrifice of innocent human blood. And there's only one person in history qualified to offer that blood. Tying into Ken's message last week, every one of us gets confused when it comes to what we have to do to approach and be accepted by God. We have a disease because we think, or at least we want to, somehow contribute to our own worthiness when it comes to qualifying as somebody who can approach God. We have to accept this paradox before we can begin to be cured of this disease of narcissism, of arrogance, Christ was the only sinless candidate who could have been sacrificed for our sins. Big question in, I don't know what's the right word here, theological, uh, religious, um, spiritual circles. How come in Christianity says there's only one way to God? Because there's only one person in history qualified to give their blood for your forgiveness. No ram, no goat, no bull, and in the gruesome tradition of some pagan religions, no other person, including anything you think you might have to offer, including any filthy rag that I think I might have to offer, was or would have been good enough. 
Folks, we put the phrase out there, we need Jesus, or y'all need Jesus. That's true, but it's not just a byline, it's the truth. His sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection are the only things that provide for our salvation. We simply don't bring anything to the table. Without Jesus, we're stuck at zero. We need Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.